Katie Montgomery is a YouTuber and an activist, and today we're going to be talking about the EHRC's letter to the government on the Equality Act, which has obviously been deeply controversial and faced widespread criticism by LGBT groups. Before we delve into any of that, though, thank you so much for joining us today, Katie. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm OK. I've, uh, I went to a wedding yesterday, so a little bit tired from that, but it was a good time, so... Other than, of course, Good. stressing about the CHRC thing, which is ruining my life. But other than that... <laughs> other than that, yes. <laughs> That's less good than the wedding. Well, I'm glad the wedding was good. Um, hope you've recovered okay. Um, so some of our viewers might not be aware of what this, what we're talking about here, what the EHRC's new guidance is on the Equality Act. Could you talk us through what their letter to the Equalities Minister, Kenny Badenock, said? Yeah, so I mean, I don't know how much background people need to know, but there's a thing in the UK called the Equality Act 2010, um, and it basically is the thing that grants people in this country their human rights, and it covers everything from uh, women's rights to LGBT rights and disabled rights and, and all kinds of things. Um, and the EHRC is the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission, and originally their purpose was to progress human rights in the UK and be an independent body from the government, but to be like the official human rights organization of the UK. Um, and that's what they were doing until three years ago or, or some, sometime around then. And uh, then the government uh, basically replaced all of the people in charge. And now it's kind of, in my opinion, um, just a vessel for the conservatives. Um, but so what they have done is they have proposed that the Equality Act 2010 be amended, so changed, changing the law. Um, and the, how they're trying to they're trying to say it as if, oh, it's just a small change. We just want to change one word. We just want to change the word sex to biological sex. And that's all. Um, and it's just, just good for women. And, and the thing is, this it's a little sort of sleight of hand and it has a lot bigger um, like. Uh, complications and, and consequences than you might think. So they have actually listed in the letter the things that they're intending for it to change. And in my opinion, and the opinion of lots of lawyers, they're actually wrong on what they think it's going to do, but also you can see what they're trying to do, and it will still do, still do a lot of bad things. And so basically, um, you have illegal sex, um, and the, you can change that. Uh, you can change that with the Gender Recognition Act 2004, and they kind of want to just get rid of that by the back door by basically saying, well, it doesn't matter what you change your legal sex to, because for the purposes of human rights legislation, your sex is just the same as your birth sex. And they want to say biological sex, but perhaps we can get into that later, but that's a whole um, sort of can of worms because that uh, doesn't quite work the same as legal sex anyway, uh, and and certainly doesn't always match up with what someone's recorded birth sex is, and there's all kinds of confusions. But basically what this would mean, and they do list this out in the letter, is that, um, or, the, or what they want it to mean, is that any business or public space or public institution could just choose to ban women like me, trans women, from women's toilets, women's changing rooms, everything to um, rape shelters and prisons and stuff. Um, and to be clear, that is a massive change. At least it's a massive change for trans people. It's not going to affect cis people, which is anyone who isn't trans at all. Um, but banning me from the toilet, I mean, I've been using the women's toilet at work for you know nearly a decade now. Um, this is just, it's, it's my normal everyday life. It's the same as everyone else. Um, and and making it so that would then be illegal for, or potentially depending on which, you know, I'd have to ring ahead every single pub and every single shop I ever want to go in to see if they will serve me, like, you know, accept my kind in there or not. Um, but also they've listed out that it would change human rights legislation. So, I mean, I've, I've been lucky in my life to uh, never had an incident of sexism at my workplace, um, which is something the Equality Act would cover. But they basically were are saying that I would no longer count as a woman for that, so would not be protected from sexism in my, in my workplace. And they even list out the gender pay gap and say, oh, well, yeah, trans women will no longer be covered for gender pay gap regulation. And like, to be clear, trans women's pay gap is even bigger. Like the gap between cis men and cis women is already awful, and trans women's is even bigger. Um, so this is very straightforwardly uh, a huge attack on 
particularly trans women's rights, but also trans men's rights um, and, and all trans people in the country. And it, I mean, I, d I don't want to fear monger and also I don't want to seem like I'm being hyperbolic, but it really isn't. If they bring in a law where people are allowed to just ban me from public spaces, effectively, you know, if you can't go to the toilet, if you can't try clothes on, if you can't, you know, it's just completely unreasonable. And like, how are people like me to participate in public society at all? So I don't know how good a summary that was, but hopefully I didn't go into too much detail. <laughs> it's incredibly helpful, but obviously also incredibly bleak. Um, so I guess there's, you touched on a lot of things there. And I think one of the things that I wanted to, to unpick a little bit is, I guess there's there's two sides of this, this really, isn't there? There's the one side, which is the, uh, the direct impact this could have on trans people if the guidance is implemented. And then there's the wider kind of um, context that it creates around trans yeah. people and trans rights in in the UK. Um, what do you think the impact of this is going to be? I, I guess there's so many different impacts, but like the EHRC used to be, a, in my opinion, fairly credible organisation, which would push for the advancement of people's human rights. And now we're in a situation where it's just you know, openly campaigning to remove trans people's rights. And they've done a 180 degree uh, change on this. Like they supported reforming the Gender Recognition Act for years, and then they got in the new people in charge, and then they were writing to the government opposing reforming the Gender Recognition Act with no, I mean, no justification for that change at all, no explanation as to why it'd be bad. Um, so that, I mean, at least for trans people, as just said, this organization is now of no value to us it's completely you know meaningless that they're, they're not credible they don't deserve respect for, for their single purpose but it's not just trans people are saying this like we saw um major lgbt organizations who focus particularly on gay rights pulling out of having any association with them because you know what lgbt rights are all very interlinked and it's the why we're sort of a political group is because homophobia and transphobia overlap so often and we often need similar things it's often attacks on our bodily autonomy our ability to you know adopt and have a family um, and all of these things which affect all lgbt people similarly so it says are this you know this group isn't trustworthy at all um and i know that other you know minority rec struggles have already been complaining about the ehrc previously and it just kind of adds more fuel to the fire of saying well you know, uh, is this just going to become a vessel for removing people's human rights? It, who, who can trust this? Even groups completely unrelated to LGBT rights. Um, so that's, I guess that's a, a, a thing for the EHRC in general. Um, but did you mean me more like what it's how it's going to affect trans people sort of in a more, um, I, I guess, the morale of trans people as like as a community? Right. Yeah. Because that, you know, when the EHRC started hiring lawyers that we knew were gender critical and they would just do these little announcements every now and then oh we're getting this new person on board and then you look at their history and you know they voted against gay marriage or they've you know been campaigning against abortion or they've been following every single transphobic loser on twitter or something and it just says oh this is bad like we saw this coming you know years years ago when they started doing all these reshuffles and every single time something like this happens you some new transphobic person gets a really big position of power or they start um they had some scandal where someone leaked that they've been meeting with a load of hate groups um it it scares it's, it's scary anyway even if they hadn't have written the, this letter or even if this all falls apart it just shows how much political power they have and it is absolutely relentless uh being a trans person in the uk at the moment like the the whole british media left to right uh constantly just pumps out the most nonsense articles about trans people um you know sometimes entirely fabricated uh there's no no one kind of arguing for the trans rights case the only pro trans stories you ever get are you know like biographies of someone coming out and having a happy time and then to counter it to balance it they'll put someone saying well we need to remove all trans rights otherwise a mystery thing that i'm just going to gesture towards um what might happen but it's it's kind of you know the highest levels of government it was also really terrifying for example when the uk government decided to overrule the scottish government's uh, vote to um reform the gender recognition act because it said you know all the way up to the top like rishi sunak 
commented on it. Like literally the person in charge of the entire country is prepared to use unprecedented legal measures to stop the most minor slight improvement in trans people's lives. It just says, well, what's coming next? You know, what, what are they going to do? Even if this fails, what's the next thing they're going to try? And it's, you know, this, our community feels very embattled. I, you know, talking to, I, I talk to hundreds of trans people every single day. Um, and people have just been messaging me saying, like, getting out the country, I can't take this anymore. Um, you know, fearing for their futures, fearing for the, what's going to happen with our healthcare, as attacks on our rights are always seem to be really interlinked with attacks on our healthcare. You know, pe people are terrified. I'm, I'm terrified. It, it is, you know, after reading that letter, I was kind of in like fight or flight, high adrenaline mode for like 24 hours at least, feeling really ill. But now I just feel so anxious from, you know, like, ha am I going to have human rights this time next year? I, d I don't know. And that is so, it's really hard to ex explain because obviously you can imagine being worried about the future, but it's, I mean, this, like the meaning of the word oppression, it's oppressive. It's, it's just something you cannot stop thinking about because it's you know they're saying oh yeah well maybe you won't be allowed to go to the toilet at work anymore i don't i, I don't know i'm kind of reiterating but it's just so intense this kind of fear and i i'm not absolutely not the only person feeling it i mean yeah i think you you put it pretty, pretty powerfully there in terms of the i guess the, the, the wider context this sits within right of like you know it's been at least half a decade a little bit longer than that where any time that the government wants to distract from anything they're yeah. doing, they'll have a bash on trans people. Any time that the media wants to distract, they'll they'll have a bash on trans people. And the the way that you know trans people are somehow become the kind of bogeyman de jour um, for a tiny minority of the population who uh, you know had uh, decades, centuries of oppression. Uh, it's yeah, like horrendous, and the way that you talked about the the kind of direct impact it has on people individually, I think, is really powerful. I've got a question that's come in from Twitter um, mm -hmm. from Max Morris, who's um, I guess asking about this in relation to previous anti-LGBT campaigns and legislation we've seen. So Max asks, um, how do we prevent the or reverse the kind of longer term impact of transphobia. So for example, we've seen changes to law and policy for following moral panics in the past. So you had section 28, uh, which obviously had a long tail far beyond the period in which that existed. So how do we, how do we, how do we build power to prevent and reverse the long term impacts of not just this, this latest example, but the wider context of attacks on, on trans people and LGBT people more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I guess what gives me hope on this is focusing on the super long term first. I mean, the gay panic, um, which saw, you know, at one point, something like only 10% of the UK population thinking that being gay was acceptable, um, all the way to where we are now, where we, although things maybe are starting to slide back, we um, have gay marriage and people can be gay openly and be on TV and stuff. And that happened in a single generation. I mean, it took decades and we still have progress to go, but people, even, even with section 28, even with, you know, making, um, gay marriage illegal and all these things, the public still just learnt about gay people and they're, they're, even with the media attacks, they couldn't like you can you can sell prejudice to people. It's quite easy to do it, and if you you can throw all these horrible articles at people day after day after day. But then if you just meet a gay person, you're like, oh, it's all rubbish. Like gay people are normal, and trans people are kind of going through that at the moment. Like we're visible for the first time in you know sort of modern history, and that means there's loads of people ready to sell prejudice to people, and people buy into it. But it was also going to be they'll see a trans person on the TV and they'll be like, oh, my favorite show has a trans person in. Or, oh, you know, there's a trans person at my school who's a, the mother of one of the children there or something, and she's normal. And then hopefully, I mean, I, th I feel like this is how sort of civil rights struggles go. After a while, the panic dies down because people realize that we're just the same as everyone else, um, which means I'm hoping... <laughs> In my lifetime, the trans panic will be over and we probably won't ever have in my lifetime full legal equality and, um, you know, free from prejudice and, and stuff. But the horror will go down and we might be back to slow progress like we were having for the decades before. 
But in the kind of medium term, I mean, one of particularly of, of for the UK is we have this very far right government, and I think a government change hopefully will make some difference. Um, I know that not all of the alternatives for the current government are the best <laughs> for trans people or in general. Um, I, but I also, I don't really want to put too much of my hope on a new government because it really is possible that the Conservatives will win again. And um, even with a government change, it's going to depend on people uh, you know, being replaced and on all of the... They've, the Conservatives have been in power for 12 years and they've done so much sort of institutional damage, destroying organizations like the EHRC, for example. It's not something you can just fix in six months. It's going to take years and years to rebuild. Um, so that is kind of worrying. But at the same time, I mean, I think that, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, in the medium term, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have that much hope, to be honest. It is kind of bad. But in, in the short term, I think the most important things to do are to like build a community with within trans people and, and people who know and, and love trans people and stuff, our uh, families, and just make sure that we're there for each other and turn up to protests and write to your MPs and let them know that if they try and do this, that it, you're going to make their life hell. You know, you're going to ring every single day and tell them to fuck off. Oh, sorry, I don't know if I can swear. Um, and, um, and, and that kind of thing. And also, um, sort of make plans, e even if they were to bring in this horrific legislation, that doesn't mean that every single business and every single, um, you know, public place will ban trans people from going there. Some will, and it'll be horrific, and our lives will be worse for ages because they're not good. I mean, Section 28 took like 20 years to repeal. So this could, who knows how long this could take. Um, but that means that we will be able to have LGBT pubs and um, you know workplaces and stuff like we did previously before we had any rights, which are spaces for us. I don't know. That kind of sounds quite depressing. I'm I'm hoping that the LGBT community can come together on this and and our allies and and people who have any kind of morals or <laughs> conscious at all might turn up to some protests to make it clear that the government it it would be a massive hassle to even attempt this in the time they have left. Um, and then we'll battle off this attack and then we'll just have to do the same thing for the next one. I don't know. I'm not feeling super positive. <laughs> so I think a lot of people also aren't feeling super positive right now, but I guess one of the things that you, you mentioned there was the government and a potential change of government. And one of the things we've had a lot of questions come in on is um, the response to the HRC letter and also the the guess the, the wider kind of moral panic and culture wars around trans rights uh, recently and the the response of other political parties, particularly those on the centre left uh, and the left, uh, to uh, the HRC letter and elsewhere. What's your, I guess, reflection on how the other parties have responded um, so far? So I think. Um... I guess if I was being optimistic, I would say that, I mean, the response from the Labour uh, Party has appeared, at least at first glance, is terrible. Um, they've pretty much just said, yeah, cool, bring it on. Let's see what happens. Um, which, as a trans person, especially someone who doesn't understand big politics and, you know, this manoeuvring they have to do, um, it really just looks like they're abandoning, abandoning us. And so many people have just said, that's it, I'm done with the Labour Party now because they've done nothing. I know that um, the Lib Dems and the Greens have said something positive, but then also both all parties have their own sort of little transphobia wing, which uh, is horrible um, and seemed very committed to pushing this forward. So, um, but I do think that there's some um, justification for the argument that, I mean, the whole point of this, the, the Conservatives don't care about trans people. I mean, some people are, chronically obsessed with trans people and cannot talk about anything else and want to ruin our lives and that's it. But most people, Rishi Sunak does not care about trans people. He doesn't care if I live or die at all. He just wants to win another election and they're gambling on on this and on culture war, you know, which is basically attacks on human rights. It's 
you know, code for. Um, he's hoping that if they deport enough people to Rwanda and ban enough trans people from the toilets, then maybe people might vote for them. But it also re it relies on this kind of like um, British gutter press kind of fear mongering nonsense. And that's fed by the Labour Party arguing back. So I, the, I'm hoping that this is the plan, though I don't know how much faith I have it in. But if someone like Keir Starmer or any of the other leaders of any of the other parties just says, OK, Rishi Sunak wants to ruin the life of trans people and immigrants, but I want to fix the country and I want to make it so your child can eat lunch at school and so that you can buy petrol and so that inflation isn't 20% or whatever ridiculous number it might get up to. And hopefully people will say, you know, even some people might be like, oh, well, I don't understand trans people. I'm kind of scared of them. But I kind of like the sound of the country being good rather than just wasting all our time attacking trans people. Um, so I don't know, as much as I would like to see uh, political parties saying this is going to ruin the lives of trans people and therefore we are opposed to it. I can also see that the Conservative government wants to bait the other parties into, you know, a, an argument, a pointless argument. And if if we were being, if we were able to argue on our on equal terms, even if we just had an equal landscape, you know, if we had like trans politicians and um, some media outlets that even were just neutral on trans people, then we would have things where they'd, they would say, this is going to ruin the lives of trans people and it isn't going to affect cis women. It's not going to change their lives at all. And that's a fact. Like th that isn't some kind of, oh, you know, you're just saying it. That is just factually true. Um, then people might understand that. But the problem is, is because of the media and the Conservative Party just have such a total dominance on this. Um, it means that they can say, oh, we just care about women. And everyone's like, oh, OK, cool. Yeah, I care about women. Do what you want. So I don't know. <laughs> Incredibly helpful, if bleak. Um, before I let you go, I just wanted to read out some of the comments we've got in the chat to you because they're lovely. Uh, so Meg said, solidarity with Katie and all trans people. Steve C said that um, Katie's interview is making them quite emotional um, and all LGB people need to stand with the T. And Max said, thank you for answering uh, their question and uh, that at least we can be slightly more hopeful about the long term, despite a bleak short to medium term and finishes by saying, see you at the protests. Um, so lots of support for everything you said, but um, I'll let you get on and enjoy the rest of your Easter Sunday. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. And everyone, please write to your MP.